Okay. 831, this is the regular meeting of the uh, Town of New Canaan Board of Selectmen, Tuesday, May 19th, 831 a.m. Um, as Tom mentioned, we have to amend the agenda for a few items. One, um, we neglected to put the Waveney Park Conservancy on um, for their front of Waveney House project, which was approved last week by the Parks and Recreation Commission. And under the MOU with the Conservancy must go through the Board of Selectmen and the Town Council tomorrow night. So in order to keep them on schedule, we'd like to add that as not, uh, after the farmer's market. And then we are adding, uh, we're revising number five, 11 to 17 with what was posted as the revisions, Tom? The revisions were on the solar and on the uh, striping of the roads. Right, but, but you posted those on the uh, revised agenda, right? They're, they're on the revised, it's a separate sheet. Right. That we need so, to so maybe when we get to those, you can you can put on the screen the revised agenda. But um, before I start, we uh, well, actually, the first item is on the agenda is the minutes. So actually, do I, do I have a motion to amend the agenda as I just discussed? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? All favor? Okay. So we're now going to the first uh, minutes for the last meeting. Any comments, corrections on the minutes from uh, the prior meeting? None here. May 5th. I have none. All in favor of approving the minutes is presented. That's unanimous. Okay. Public comments. Members of the public are welcome to provide comments to the Board of Selectmen on agenda topics scheduled for review and or vote. Comments should be submitted to the following email address. BOS distribution at newcanaanct.gov. I have one comment um, that was submitted yesterday. Um, and we will keep the comment period open throughout the meeting. So if we do receive emails, I think this is the only email I've seen. Anybody, Kit, Nick or Kit, have you seen? Uh... No, we just have one, Kev. So why don't we, uh, I'll, I'll read this uh, and comment on it uh, later on in the meeting so we can get started with our. Uh, Farmers Market and Waving and Conservancy presentations. So I'd like the Farmers Market and Waving and Conservancy both to limit your presentations to 10 minutes. We have a really full schedule this morning. Um, and therefore, Patricia, are you up for the uh, Farmers Market? Is Lexi on also? If you could un unmute, uh, Patricia. Good morning, Kevin. Good, good morning, morning, everybody. Good morning, Patricia. Yep, we're both here. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you could, in 10 minutes, give us an update on the proposed uh, walkthrough Farmer's Market. How about if we do it in five? That way, if you have any questions, we've got a few minutes. Okay. Well, that's right. what I meant. Incl including questions. you got 10 minutes. All right. So we'll make it really quick. Um, can I share my screen? Everybody okay with that? And then you have the, not everybody has the presentation. Um, let me start talking. Tom, if you want me, do you want to share the file that I sent? Or I can do it. But I can't share it. Tom, could you authorize pa Patricia to share? I can authorize it. Hold on. I'm, I was going to try to get that agenda item. I'm on my computer and I got to go to the town computer and I'm trying to do the Okay. Meeting. So let me just start talking then. Um, what we're proposing is a walkthrough model. We want to start May 30th, not this Saturday. Um, it's been going quite well doing the drive through model. And um, for those of you that don't have the presentation, basically the number of cars and the number of orders both increased by about um, number of cars by almost 50% in number of orders, um, not revenue, but orders about 20% from week to week. So that went really well. Uh, we think we need another week uh, of the drive through model in order to get ourselves organized for the both the residents in town as well as for the vendors. So with that, what we're proposing, I'm going to go actually, um, for those of you who have the presentation, if you would look at page eight, because that has the map. You can share if you'd like. It's open. Thank you. Um, let me do that. Now, it says I can't share. So um, what we're proposing is that we do kind of a, a sort of a hybrid model for the opening of doing a walkthrough model. And what we would do is basically set up the vendors uh, the way that they have been set up around the periphery of the lot. We would have people enter through the 
developed a lot the way that they do today through her walking in. Um, given that we want to maintain social distance, I'm proposing or we are proposing that uh, the only cars that we let park in the lot are for either handicapped or senior citizens who can't work, walk farther and potentially the volunteers to get the volunteer cars off the street. Um, when you come into the lot, people would go and wait online, queue up. We would ha have a single entrance and a single exit to the lot for pedestrians so that it's not just a free for all, that people have to kind of come and check in and that way we can make sure everybody's wearing a mask. We can make sure people know the rules of the, the road as they go into the market and we can stagger entrance um, for pedestrians if we need to, so to make sure it doesn't get too crowded. So we have a table at the market entrance, which would basically be near where the first, um, first vendor is set up. That's a parking slot number 23. Uh, for the first week, maybe the first few weeks, what we're also thinking is that we would request that anyone who comes to the market for the first two hours register. Um, that's to limit the number of people in what's usually a very busy time in the first couple hours. After the first couple hours, it would be open. So that's how we're thinking to monitor um, the, the pedestrians coming in. In terms of the vendors, um, the vendors would maintain the social distancing or the distance between their individual tents, the way that we have it set up today for the drive-through model. And as we potentially add vendors, they would go around the, again, the periphery um, towards, towards where CNH Auto is set up so that we could maintain distance. We would not have any vendors around the grass island in the center of the market like we have had in past. That's just to allow for either lines for people to wait in line as they um, go to the market or allow people to walk without getting too close. The vendors will still or have the ability to pre-order. That seemed to work out very well, although I will say that it adds a full day of extra work to the vendors, especially for the, the farmers or those that have a large inventory of products. It's just a lot of work to manage and pre-package everything. On the flip side, it's actually worked pretty well because people seem to have been buying more. They're going through the, the trouble of getting to the market and pre-registering. They're looking to see what other vendors are there and what they have, so that's actually worked pretty well. The vendors are happy about that, but not the extra work. So we think this hybrid of being able to pre-purchase if they want to do, plus being able to purchase on site is good. Uh, for purchasing on site, consistent with what all the um, other markets in the area, including Greenwich and New Milford, I think we talked about last time, they are um, doing the same kind of model. People do not touch any food. They point, they get online, they look at what's available, they can point. The vendor actually prepackages everything and um, manages uh, payment, which could either be, um, to hopefully will be electronic through a credit card or Venmo or PayPal, something like that. Um, we are thinking um, because we want to anticipate what could potentially be an issue or a problem. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is um, hire a second off-duty police officer to be inside the market. We always have someone outside the market to manage foot traffic and, um, or you know, pr protect the foot traffic coming into the market and stopping auto traffic. But we'd like to have somebody else inside the market just to reinforce the importance of the social distancing. So if you could go to, I think, page eight, um, All right. That one? There. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, so this helps better to visualize the, the layout of the market. And the other thing we're going to do this week is um, make up a card that we can hand to everybody who attends the market that says, here are the rules for coming to the walkthrough market next week. So they've got it in hand. Um, we'll do all the, you know, post it on social media. Thanks. Robin's helpful with that. And we'll ask uh, Mike Handler if he would talk about the market when we go to an open model as well, so that or the walkthrough model so that we can, you know, reinforce it. 
having him do that last time, talk about the market was really helpful. Okay, that's all I needed to say, I think. Okay, Kit or Nick, questions? I'm sorry, am I on mute? No, we can no have... Nick is muted though. Nick is unmuted himself. <laughs> uh, I think this is terrific. Um, it's, it's a natural progression from the drive-through, which has been really successful, um, having you know, seen it firsthand. Um, I, I mean, I have no, no criticisms, complaints whatsoever. I think, uh, you know, this is directed at maintaining the safest environment you can have. Um, I think we all are coming to the realization you're better off outside than inside. So I, I think outdoor shopping, um, just like outdoor dining, uh, is, uh, is, is, you know, is safer in the end of the day. And, and you guys have done a fantastic job um, of first putting together the drive-through plan and, and again, the natural progression to uh, essentially morphing the drive-in plan to a walk plan so it's a great job thank you and um a question i don't know am i actually talking at this point can you hear me <laughs> okay, okay very much um i, I know we're going to have a, a second police officer i'm wondering is there going to be actual enforcement about wearing masks i'm really glad you raised that question i i think we need i'm looking for the town to support this but lexi and i have and Don, we feel strongly that we need to enforce that. I, I think we've seen enough people in their cars just concerned about safety, which we are as well. Um, and we just want to make sure that everybody who comes to the market feels safe. That's a good question. But Patricia, how many um, of the, of the drive-through model, and I think you've had two, two, two weeks of that, right? How many people in the cars were not wearing masks uh, that I noticed I saw four people maybe four people they kept their windows up but you know maybe an inch down so they could talk to us when they checked in but that was about it everybody and in some cars people did bring their kids a few cars they actually had their dogs but you know they're in the car so I wasn't going to turn people away for that but I you know, as we people came through, we told them they can't bring children. Certainly, they should know not to bring pets. But there were about four or five people that I noticed. I don't know, Lexi, Don, maybe you have a different number, but not most people had masks. And may I presume that the vendors as well will be wearing masks and gloves? Absolutely. They have been, but they will continue to. Absolutely. And Good. I know this has been a tremendous amount of work, and I think it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. So I would just reiterate, you know, Mar Farmer's Market is part of downtown, and we have a mass required uh, when you're downtown policy for starting tomorrow. Um, and uh, we also, um, Lexi can, you know, we've got lots and lots of the surgical masks. If, if initially you want to make sure you can hand them out to people that don't have them, um, uh, that would be a good thing to do. Okay, we can get them from Jen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. That, that's a great, a great suggestion, a good compromise. But, and I know some people are very uncomfortable wearing masks. I'm sensitive to that. But I, I think if they're that uncomfortable, they shouldn't be at the market or they should get a personal shopper or a, a volunteer shopper, I should say. And the, the town's certainly making those available. And those of us that are volunteers, if somebody shows up, they don't want to wear a mask. Um, I'm sure one of the volunteers would be happy to, to go through the market and get things for them. Actually, that's a good point to, to re re reiterate also. The uh, Human Services Department is giving out uh, vouchers for for those who qualify. And um, if for the seniors who are getting vouchers, they really should have someone shop for them. We have plenty of volunteers um, who are helping seniors shop in the uh, supermarkets. And this is this really the same thing. So... Uh, Anybody who needs a volunteer can call Human Services and uh, or call anybody in town government. We'll put you in touch with uh, Human Services to get a volunteer to shop for you. Look, nobody likes wearing a mask. I mean, they're hot, they're uncomfortable. 
but that's a small price that you have to pay in order to open up our downtown. I mean, I'd much rather, you know, wear a mask and be able to eat outdoors downtown to go to the farmer's market to shop uh, at our businesses. It's a small price to pay. So, um, you know, th this honestly was one of our concerns so that if, if someone does come and they're um, insistent on going into the market but not wearing a mask, I mean, we obviously will be respectful, but I think it's important to be able to be assertive that they must wear a mask. And if they have any concerns about that, they can reach out to the Board of Selectmen or to the Department of Health. But I, I think that's where you know we need to draw the line for the safety of everybody at the, the market. I yeah, can just, okay. Any more questions? We, we have to st stay to our schedule here. That's all you know, we have. So are we good? I move, I, move, well, I move we approve the plan as presented by uh, Lexi and Patricia. Second? Second. Okay, discussion? All in favor? You're now you're approved, Patricia. Lexi, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And, and I assume we kind of lay this out in phases. Do we need to come back to you if only if something significant changes? Well, I'll go, go back to Jen. The health department really uh, is in charge of these, uh, especially the grocery store, the vendors of food. Okay, thank you all very much. Yeah. One question, one question. Um, I, what is the definition of a child? You said no children. Mm. Good so question. What we were, what we're ideally going for is one member per family, right? Like the same as they would in a grocery store. You're, you're asking for people to shop alone whenever possible. I, I might express that that way sure. rather than say no children, because it's hard to know what, right, right. What's the cutoff? What is someone that's 12? Right. right. We could say no strollers. That's one problem we have now is a vendor who typically brings his son who is 12. And so we were, um, I'm not sure what the answer is for that because I don't want him getting harassed that his 12 year old is at the farmer's market and there's no children allowed. So we may lose that vendor partially because of that reason. I think if you had that rule, one shopper per family, then he's not a shopper. He's a worker. Yeah, Correct. that's fine. That's great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to. Thank you. Waveney Park day. Conservancy. We have uh, Caroline Garrity, the chairman of the Waveney Park Conservancy Board, and um, Jane Gember uh, is going to make the presentation for us. And Jane, can can you put it up on the screen? I think uh, Tom is going to do that for us. But while he's doing that, I'll just um, give a little intro. I'm Jane Gamber. I am a, a member of the uh, Park Conservancy Board. And we're excited to present to you the next project that we are hoping to undertake, which is the renovation of the front gardens at Waveney. Um, I'll start by reviewing just really quickly the um, investments that the Found, uh, that the Conservancy has made in Waveney at this, uh, to date, it's a little over a million dollars. The key uh, restorations that have been undertaken, either completed or are underway, are the Anderson Pond, which was a $350,000 investment from the Andersons in, con in conjunction with a lot of um, work through Tiger and John uh, in the t with the town. The Jenny and Meadow is a $375,000 investment. The Park Fair Garden, which was the Conservancy, the Garden Club, and the town together, uh, was another one. Trail restoration, uh, the summer internship program. And this is the next of the phases that we're hoping to undertake. Uh, as Tom is looking to put, put that up there, I know you're all familiar with existing conditions of overgrown plants plantings, broken walkways. Um, there's sandbags around window wells because there was a lot of uh, water issue based on the pitch of the gardens. Um, so there are a number of hardscape issues that need to be addressed as well as all of the plantings. So we're pleased to have hired Jennifer Anderson of JADD uh, Design for the design of this and um, with all the if all, all the approvals go well, 
to uh, do the installation as well. It's a two-phase program that we're looking at, and Tom might be able to find, there we go. Um, so you can review this later with the, uh, the first two pages and then the existing conditions. When we get to the first of the drawings, it will show the foundation plantings, if you will, along the front of Waveney. So we're still looking at existing conditions now. And then we can scroll down further for the, um, yep. So those are broken slates on the walkways and we'll see the sandbags on the window wells in a moment. On the left, uh, the ramp that we see on the right, is, I understand is being uh, redesigned and rebuilt by the town uh, for ADA compliance. That part of the uh, design, we're not doing anything, we're not addressing until after the, um, those issues have been resolved with the re-ramping and the ADA compliance. Um, the next uh, page will show, it's sideways, um, it shows the foundation garden. Uh, so you'll see that the, um, that the driveway goes around the houses to the right, the port cochere is uh, down at the bottom of your screen. And there are just a number of um, varied plantings, many natives, as many natives as possible. All of the plantings that are being designated do well with the um, conditions, the light conditions, water conditions that are uh, prevalent in that particular location. As we go to the next slide, we'll see that the courtyard, uh, an alley of trees has been designed on the outer sides of the driveway and it will be continue to be grass on the interior um, portions of it. Um, and I think that that is pretty much uh, the third slide that we'll see is what we would undertake as a second tranche on this. And that is outside the stone walls where you just begin to enter the driveway is a proposal of a hedge uh, with very much like an English country house, a hedge uh, of ilex with uh, boxwood accentuating the piers. Um, a very quick overview of this. The timing would be that we would begin with hardscape, tree removal, and um, the, the uh, uh, other portions of this to uh, get the structure for us and then do the planting either later in the summer or early in the fall. Uh, that's a very quick overview. The budget for this is $125,000. It is to be fully funded by the Waveney Park Conservancy. That includes all of the plant material. It includes all the hardscape, irrigation, and lighting, which would be for the, um, both to, for safety and for enhancing the uh, house in the evening for events. Um, it's been endorsed by both the Conservancy and was un uh, unanimously uh, approved by Park and Rec last week. So I guess we should open it up for questions. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Kit, Nick? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm on mute or not. Oh, okay, so the this is just interested. In the alley of trees, will there be uniform, uniformity of um, species or? Yes. Could, yes, so it'll be like one, one form of tree that creates the alley. Yes. Great. Looks great. Yeah, this is terrific. I guess my only, my, my question is um, historically, how does this work into, you know, you know, the history of Waving House? And I assume it's, um, all of this is based on former plans or is this a whole new de novo? Um, it's kind of a hybrid 
on as you as I'm sure you know when the Laphams lived here they had 21 uniformed gardeners to take care of the house at all times uh, the gardens alone so what we tasked the designer with was to do as much as she could to marry some of the original Olmsted design with the need for maintaining a public park and the conservancy and the same the uh the same commitment that we have with the parterre garden the conservancy will do the maintenance for three years and then to get all the structure in place and then after that the town will um take it over and the the key thing is that we have to make sure that this is able to be maintained beautifully without undue effort and by the town did, did you say 21 uniform gardeners? That's what they used to have in white. They all wore white, yes. On a Zoom call. <laughs> John so Howe would be, John Howe would be jealous. A different model now. Yeah, we'll, we'll schedule it. No hurry. I mean, no hurry on my end. I would note a couple of things. Nick, do you have any further questions? No. Yeah, this is a great plan. And thanks again to the Conservancy for their generosity and, and, and making our town and our crown jewel Waveney Park a better place. I would note a couple of things. I watched the Parks and Rec meeting afterwards, uh, and um, Steve Banco noted there's a couple of trees that were planted in the front yard dedicated to someone's memory. Mm. Um, where does that stand, Jane and, and uh, Caroline? So Jennifer um, said that she was absolutely taking that under advisement. I think there's another one that was a dogwood tree on the west side that will also need to be considered as, um, as the design is amended because those are memorial trees that really need to be, um, need to stay in the design in one way or another. Although I would, I would, I don't know how mature these trees are uh, and, and whether or not perhaps we could, you know, when you're looking to redesign something that's in keeping with the character and history of the house, um, you know, we may have to reevaluate and perhaps we could um, move trees or plant a replacement tree if it doesn't fit with the design. Um, so and we'll bring that back to the designer. Um, and otherwise I'll leave my, you know, the, the, the parks and rec, uh, approve this town council tomorrow night can have their shot at it, um, to make sure that anybody doesn't have any concerns about the plan or the, the respect for the, the history. Um, so I have no further questions. I also would like to thank the Conservancy and Caroline for all your hard work and uh, Jane. Uh, um, I, uh, I love all the work that the Conservancy has done and I think um, you know this, this continues the plan to restore the grounds as the town will um, uh, continue to restore the hardscape. And uh, so with that, again, I thank you and I would move we approve the plan as presented by Jane. <clears throat> Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thanks again, Caroline. Jane, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your support. Thank you. Okay. That returns us to item four. Why don't I do this? Again, if anyone wants to send a comment from the public, you can email to BOS, which stands for Board of Selectmen, BOS distribution spelled out all one word at newcanaanct.gov. And I'll take this opportunity to read one comment that we received yesterday. This was from Jamie Grozowski. Uh, she said, I was wondering where the new infections are coming from. In other words, where are people still catching the virus? It seems New Canaan has been immaculate for weeks, months, and most people have stayed at home. So it is hard to understand where new infections are contracted. Um, my comment on this would be that, um, you know, it is true that New Canaan has comparatively, um, when you look at the statistics that the state keeps, um, very low, low um, incidence of infections. We have about 160 reported, recorded positive ca cases. Uh, obviously, the number of recorded cases depends upon how much testing you've been doing. Um, but um, so of the 210 total recorded cases that Mike reports about. Um, we have um, 29 who have passed away, primarily from uh, senior facilities. And um, 
and, and all of them, virtually all of them over 85 years old. And um, another 30 that are staff members at either Wave Indian Care Center or Silver Hill Hospital. So the residence is actually um, quite remarkably low at about 160, 270. Um, yesterday morning I, when I saw, I see the daily list of, of new, we've had very few um, new cases in the past couple few weeks. When I saw the name of a 75 year old yesterday, I, who I know, um, I scratched my head because I know they are staying home. Um, and um, then when you know, Jen uh, Allison calls every recorded case and talks to them as to where they've been, and in this case, they, they were out of town. So it's true that um, cases are coming from out of town, not um, from local community transmission for the most part. <clears throat> um, we suspected perhaps um, housekeepers or uh, aides, or, you know, which was the case with a few of the seniors who uh, got very sick because they had aides coming into their house um, of one type or another. And we've encouraged people not to have cleaning people come into seniors' homes. Um, and uh, so I, if, if anybody has any further comments about that, uh, ask you, Jen is on. I didn't realize Jen is on. Good morning, Jen. Good morning. Hey, you, you want to comment further? I mean, I again, I, uh, I I'm not proud of, but I'm 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 very um, comforted by the fact that new Canaanites have been able to stay at home, especially the seniors, and protect the community. So the cases we have seen, um, primarily, we've been able to trace from people who have traveled, the, the very early ones and the subsequent ones. Uh, um, do you have any further comment, Jen? There are still, you know, the few cases where they've only gone places like the grocery store. So that was prior to everyone wearing masks. So again, I think it's important that people follow the guidance. And per the governor's orders, starting tomorrow, you must follow those sector rules. And it also helps with the transmission. If everybody's masks, it greatly reduces the transmission rate. So. No, I agree. You know, with the house cleaners and the home health aides and stuff like that, you, you have to be safe. So, and and once we begin to reopen things, people can't get complacent. You can't have a giant block party downtown, which is exactly what we're not doing. We're doing this safely for a reason. So we just want people to remember to do that. And over the summer, don't have huge house parties and stuff like that. And we can continue to reopen things slowly and safely so <clears throat> and also yeah. as as we'll note further the uh we're going to be delayed until friday to get the uh barriers up downtown so the store the restaurants probably will not be open until friday look i think the, i think the headline here <clears throat> excuse me the headline here is that the town the people of the town of new canaan have done a hell of a good job social distancing wearing masks um, you know, following the rules. We just had an example, I think Patricia said, of the five or 600 cars who went through uh, the farmer's market last week, only four, four uh, people weren't, weren't wearing masks. I mean, that's an example of, 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 of a town coming together and, and, and generally following the rules. Now, I agree with Jen, um, as we open up downtown, you know, we, we still need to be very vigilant um, as citizens, but I think that the folks of New Canaan have been have, have come through this in, in in really solid form. Yeah. Another thing is we de we as we've told people we tested all the town employees yesterday, and all the first responders and their families last Friday. So once we get the results of these tests, and then we're we're going to begin a program starting next Tuesday for community testing. Um, we'll have a much better handle on the overall incidents and also the. Uh, uh, with the blood test, an indication of how many people may have actually been had it and didn't realize it back in February, and March. So it, it'll be interesting when we start seeing those results. Um, Kevin, when it when when the process opens up to the town as a whole, will everyone be able to uh, be tested? Yes, everyone except under ten years old. Correct. Um, and the um, the insurance pays for your testing. Correct. So, we're going to have some process where you can sign up online and show up at the location, which we'll disclose later um, at, at your appointed time. 
it may take a few weeks to get everyone who wants to get tested tested. But quite honestly, the more we test, the more we're going to show that. Uh, well, let's wait for the results. But I think <laughs> our our, our, our <laughs> Well, but no, seriously, we we, we uh, it, it, when when you isolate, self isolate, as people have been doing, especially the seniors, you. Uh, uh, remarkably keep down the, uh, the the trouble is people letting down their guard and beginning to travel to other areas um, that's when we're going to have problems when people think it's safe to do things uh, uh, and again the, the governor's order is still even tomorrow from tomorrow with phase one no gatherings of more than five I, I, I guess the assumption is or the expectation is he may increase that to more than 10 no more than 10 on June 20th but uh, that's why um, plans are, you know, we, there can be no large gatherings. So anyway, if, if, um, if anybody else has comments, please email them. Let's get back to the agenda. We have um, uh, go to item four, which is the printer copy machines. Uh, Tiger, who, who's doing, actually doing the? Uh... That's Chris. Ah, Chris. Chris, Chris Kaiser, IT. Morning. We'll make it quick and sweet. Um, we're looking to uh, to renew our contract with all 20 copiers for all departments. Um, the vendor that we use is currently on state contract. Um, they are changing their lending company. We do a four-year lease, and they know that every year that it has to go through the budget, it's stipulated in the contract, uh, the verbiage, uh, and it's it's uh, as it's always been. Um, we're happy with the service. We're happy with the performance of the machines. Um, and it's actually uh, going to be somewhere around a $1,200 annual savings. So we, we're saving money this year, this time with this contract as well. Okay. Questions for Chris? I have one. You, go ahead, Nick. No, go ahead, Chris. I need a kid. All right. The, uh, in terms of the maintenance agreement, I just didn't understand how that functions at per copy rates. No, the maintenance is free. The, we get charged per copy. So oh. whether it be, right. So whether it be, and that's the wear and tear on the machine. So we end up paying for the, um, the, uh, the copies themselves. They come in and, and any break fix, they, they provide at no cost. Thank you. Well, this one's pretty cut and dry. Sorry. <laughs> hey, Nick, your question? None. I move or approve the request from the information technology department to enter into a following four year lease or upgrade with prism office solutions for 20 copy printer machines um, as described in, on the agenda there. Do I have a second? Okay, Kit, second. Um, <laughs> uh, all uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, it's unanimous Tom. Going to solar consulting. This is one of the items that was revised for the agenda um, and Therefore, um, Tiger, could you? Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, as Kevin mentioned, this was uh, this was revised when uh, when the consultant first came forward with his proposal. It was for seventy five hundred dollars total. Um, the draft that we received, or the final draft we received last night, um, he actually added five hundred dollars for reimbursable expenses to make the total or up to five hundred dollars for re reimbursable expenses to make the total eight thousand. So I apologize for the late entry. Uh, this is with MHR development. They've done uh, the first phase of solar installations on the on the four town roofs that we had. Uh, the project went very well. Everything's functioning well, and we're seeing uh, savings as we go forward. This would be phase two for basically the exact same type of work. Uh, preparation of an RFP, um, ZREC procurement, and uh, our net metering application, um, and then project management of the uh, of the work as it's installed. This would be for three buildings, the wastewater treatment facility control building, uh, SAC school cafeteria roof and roof at West school, all which are um, ready to go. The, the control building at the wastewater plant, we feel it's at 20 years, we're having it reevaluated to see how much life it has left in it, but that might have to be replaced before we start this portion of that, that project. It's also working to combine this RFP with other facilities in town, not managed by the town, but others being uh, the Waveney Inn and the New Canaan YMCA. 
uh, so we can get see to get a little bit better bang for our buck moving forward, uh, trying to group everything together. So the proposal is for seventeen thousand five hundred dollars, basically twenty five hundred dollars per building, uh, with five hundred dollars for reimbursable expenses for a total of eight thousand dollars. So Tiger, this is phase two. How many phases do we do we envision? Uh, as roofs become available, we'll continue to. Uh, to place them on it. We're, we're, we're looking at other ones that we have as well. Um, the top of the, uh, the highway garage um, where, where, our, where our salt is stored, um, the pretreatment building in the wastewater plant, other facilities as they come forward. The high school roofs uh, would be another um, area to, to expand on. Uh, so they'll be, they'll be, as roofs become available, we'll continue to move this forward. But he's trying to develop one specific kind of RFP that then we could then utilize throughout um, the rest of the phases. I don't recall, um, it, you know, under the new, the proposed new library um, plans, did they uh, incorporate solar? I don't recall. They had it in their, in their drawing. They did, yeah. yeah. Good. Any questions, Kit? I have none. I would emphasize that this is, um, you know, we're going to, going forward, we're going to do PPAs. We approved the uh, PPA for uh, eSchool, the roof that's being done at eSchool this summer. Uh, although, again, we're essentially looking for a financial partner because uh, solar is a commodity. The panels are primarily made overseas or in Canada. And uh, uh, with the slowness in the economy, a lot of people are pulling back and doing projects. So we think advantageous to go out and as Tiger mentioned um, Mark uh, Robbins has been working with both Waveney Care Center and um, the YMCA if they want to tag along with the pricing we're able to get on a, on a, a larger order uh, the, we're essentially looking for a financial partner who's willing to take the investment tax credit before it expires at the end of the year and, and commit to do projects um, more economically than we could do as separate projects so um, I'm in favor of this project and I would move we approve the request from the Department of Public Works to enter into a contract with MHR development for a total of eight thousand uh, dollars for project development and project management services for the three town buildings and um, uh, do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Um, just one question. What is the likelihood we'll be able to find that partner? Well it's a very competitive market. That's, you know, the, 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 the Board of Ed used uh, Davis Hill um, and, um, and Joanne Keating negotiated for East School, I think four and a half cents. We got four cents a kilowatt hour for South School, which is terrific pricing. Um, and um, hopefully um, Davis Hill will bid as well as others. And, and we'll, again, we're, we will essentially use the same contractor for the other roofs. Um, it's, so we're really picking a financial partner who wants to have a sharp pencil to uh, uh, give us the best pricing, given the, the cost of panels, which uh, if we buy off, so if we, if we bundle projects together and buy panels um, in bulk, we will save money. So it just makes sense for us to try to maximize our position for the town, the schools, and if we can, Wave Any Care Center, which um, has a brand new roof on the New Canaan Inn on Owen Oak Ridge and also um, uh, and the YMCA, which has brand new roofs as part of the renovation. So signing a PPA is kind of a no brainer because you're going from like 16 cents a kilowatt hour to four or five cents a uh, kilowatt hour. And it's just automatic savings at the, at the strike of, stroke of a pen. So, so I moved it. This is our discussion. Um, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Kit, thank you. Um, going to traffic safety barriers. I, um, in order to move along the project to accommodate outdoor dining, I uh, approved this agreement on an emergency basis last um, Friday. Um, hopefully, they'll be delivered by Thursday, so we can get the restaurants up and running by Friday. These are the white plastic water-filled barriers that you may see downtown on Locust and. Uh, forest at the 42 forest project and um, we're buying 70 of them which we can use in the future but so sixteen thousand six hundred dollars tiger do you have any, any further explanation no you did a great job we uh we contacted 
the manufacturer, if they're coming manu uh, from the, directly from the manufacturer, we contacted them yesterday looking for a specific delivery date. We're hoping for Wednesday and have everything up by Friday. How is this being accounted for in the budget? We have monies available at, in our current highway maintenance budget. And these are, the kind, these, are the, these are the kind of expenses that possibly could be COVID related. There's two sources of federal funds for, right. for COVID related expenses, both FEMA and also the COVID something fund. Um, uh, that, that was my next question, Kevin, whether we could get reimbursement for this. We're going we're gonna to try. We're going to keep track of it as such, but we have monies available if not. Good. Um, uh, get a question? Yeah, just one. What actually happens to these water filled barriers if a car hits them? They don't move. They don't. <laughs> they're, designed, they're designed very similarly to a concrete barrier curb. Um, so if you hit it hard enough, can you break it? Yeah, I've seen concrete barriers break, but the, at the speeds that they're traveling on Elm Street and the other areas where we're placing them, uh, we shouldn't see it. Plus, it'll be a, instead of a straight on shot, it's more of a glancing blow. Uh, it's really just a reminder that you, you know to protect pedestrians. And we will hopefully have someone uh, like the Beautification League or the Garden Club want to put planters on top of these and make them uh, prettier than they already are. Right. We've reached out to the, to the Beautification League. We've reached out to a couple of other areas, um, some landscapers, to see if they can help us beautify the, uh, the area. And then if someone wanted to buy the plant, they could buy the plant. Hey, Kevin, I think Tucker had her hand up. I did. I just wanted to add, I'm sure you all know this, but just for the record, we have um, Jen and uh, Jen from Health and Lynn from Planning and Zoning. Myself had a Zoom call last week with all of the restaurants to let them know what the plan was. Went very well. Jen went through all of the health protocols and what was going to be expected. Uh, Lynn went through any zoning issues. I went through some of the practical issues. Um, there's been some questions, but um, everybody's really appreciative of the effort that has gone into this from the town's uh, point of view and uh, appreciates it. We know there'll be some bumps along the way, but I think uh, communication is key and they feel that we are all working on their behalf and hopefully um, we'll get them a, get the uh, supplies here and up and get people eating outside safely over the next few days. Hey, Tucker, how many tables in total um, do you expect there to be? It's hard to tell because what happened yesterday was the application went live. Uh, Lynn attended a, Lynn from Lynn Brooks Avni attended a seminar, a virtual seminar on Friday, and there was some new language that needed to be inserted into the sidewalk sale, a sidewalk cafe permit. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and so she had to modify that over the weekend and get that updated. So the application went live yesterday. And what part of the application process is, is they have to draw out the restaurant. Each restaurant has to draw out and sketch out what their planning is, sort of measure out the, the spot. My goal, and I, I don't know the number, but to answer your question visually is, I, I'm assuming that everybody's going to, hoping to put out the same amount of tables that they had before just in double the space, if you will, because they only went out to a portion of the sidewalk. We didn't build anything here to, to theoretically let anybody expand. Um, and I heard a, a, a nice um, uh, thing that came of this just last night was the, per, the landlord of that little pocket park down on Forest Street. Um, she is the same landlord that is for Gates, Tequila, um, Farmer's Table and the Diner. And they've all expressed some interest in possibly using that space. So Lynn is working with them to see if that's possible, if that could be a space to accommodate a few more tables. Great. So I don't have an exact number for you. Once everybody's up and running, I think that'll be an interesting number, Nick, that we might want to gather and see how everybody landed. Um, but uh, right now we just said we want everyone to be able to at least have the tables that they had before, but just with twice as amount of, of space. Right. And obviously rest restaurant by restaurant, it's going to vary because some yeah. restaurants are going to benefit from, if you look over at Upper Crust, uh, UCBC over there by uh, where McKenzie's used to be, uh, McKenzie's and the spot next to McKenzie's are both vacant and that's undercover. It's got a little portico. So I said to him, you know, why don't you just kind of spread it out down the line, you know? Uh, so he's going to have a little of an advantage there because he happens to have some empty storefront that he can right. undercover, which is kind of nice. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I move we approve a purchase of uh, traffic safety barriers from Traffic Safety Service 
but it costs us sixteen thousand six hundred dollars. Do I have a second? Sec second here. Discussion for the kit. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Number seven. Um, we have any wall repair? Yes. Uh, this uh, was actually noticed by Steve Banco of a weekend. Um, this happened pretty much uh, after one storm. So you'll, uh, in the memo, you'd actually see the picture of uh, one of the columns that was uh, had lost a substantial amount of material, brick material, and then a couple of the coping stones had fallen off of one of the walls. This is the wall at Waveney leading to the gazebo, along the gazebo walk. So we went out and got a price from Maduri Masonry. He's the one who did the wall for the parterre garden. Did a very, very nice job on those walls uh, last year. Gave us a price to uh, repair, actually take down the entire column. We've already taken it down because of safety reasons, but basically rebuild the entire column, um, straighten up the wall in certain locations, replace the coping stones, <coughs> excuse me, and then repoint uh, a majority of the wall since we're getting water infiltration in to the joints and that's causing us uh, the problems that we see. Uh, his price was $6,750. We added a contingency of $1,000 for a project total of $7,750. And the funds are currently available on the wall, wave any wall repair um, budget line item. Leave it to Steve, leave it to Steve to, <laughs> to notice this. Well, what caused this? Do we know, Tiger? Just, just water age? infiltration and age, yeah, age. predominantly. Right. Kit, any questions? I have none. I move or approve this request from the Department of Public Works to enter into a contract with Maduri Masonry for a total of $7,750, which includes a contingency of $1,000 for the construction of portions of the existing stone wall and pillar along the walkway to the gazebo at Waveney House. Second. Second. Get a second. Discussion? All in, favor. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Unanimous. Lawn mower. This is a, a purchase of a 48 inch or four foot wide deck mower uh, for the highway department from Schmitz and Seraphine's True Value. It's under state contract, uh, so the price is $5,519 and the funds are currently available. Pretty straightforward. I move we approve the request from the Department of Public Works to buy this lawn mower under state contract for $5,519. Uh, second? Second here. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. The next one will be handled by Jim. Jim Rogers. Good morning, Jim. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's for uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, we received six bids on this. Uh, Univar was the lowest bid. Uh, we've used the vendor before. There's money in the budget, and we're expecting a savings of $800. Terrific. Any questions for Jim? None here. None here. I move to approve a request from the Department of Public Works to enter into a one year agreement with Univar Solutions for a total of 18392 for um, Univar Sol Solutions. No, no, that's a liquid petroleum liquid <laughs> hydroxide. <laughs> uh, do I have a second? Second here. Discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mead Park Lancer. Actually, I tell you, I, why don't you explain this? I, I actually, I think I'd like to remove this item from the agenda and, and we can talk about it at a future meeting. Wh which item? Number 11, no, number 10. You want to, I, I had Maria to talk about it. We can talk about it or you can chill it, whatever. Well, well again, I, I, I didn't, catch this until late this weekend that, that I didn't know enough about it. Um, I guess the idea is here that we'd like to have, be able to better have a master plan for the parks, but this is kind of the, a, a discretionary kind of thing in, in this kind of environment. And I'd like to uh, want to understand it further before we uh, bring it to uh, a vote. And uh, so uh, maybe we'll bring it back in two weeks, but I, I given the length of our agenda, why don't we table, ta table this item uh, for now. Okay. I move, Nick and Kit, I, I move we table this to, so we we all can learn more about it before we want to proceed with this. Second here. Okay. That's, that's tabled. Um, line striping removal and installation. This is a revised item as uh, Tom has put up, put up on the screen. 
posted on the revised agenda. That's correct. The uh, We had received a quote from the contractor and then in reviewing it, we noticed that he had missed one subset of roads, uh, our crack seal roads to be restriped. Um, so we went back to him and he was able to give us the revised quote as of yesterday. So this is in essence for our micro thin overlay and Cape seal projects. We need to remove the existing striping and then restripe. And then after we crack seal, after the five year uh, time frame, we restripe the road again, since the crack sealing tends to take off some of the joint in the center line. Uh, so it's kind of a joint project for all of the uh, maintenance activities we have going on right now. Um, they're crack sealing at present. We'll be looking to remove the lines that need to be removed and then micro thin overlay should happen hopefully right after Memorial Day and Cape sealing will happen as well. Uh, it's probably about two weeks of work to be done. So this came from safety markings. Safety markings is on the state procurement contract for the work. Uh, we were looking for $24,116.50 for removal of line striping and then reinstallation $47,608.54. For a total of 71,725,04, we added a contingency of 10,750 for a total of 82,475,04. The monies are currently available in our in our paving budgets. Any questions on this item? None here. None here. Okay, I move we approve this uh, request from Public Works to enter into a contract with safety markings, as Tiger just described it, and as reflected in the revised agenda. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? It's unanimous. Tom. Twelve. Item twelve. Okay. So um, you yeah, have, we have, one, have. We have one to add. I'm sorry. Se Seventeen will be. We'll come 17, back to that. You want to add? Okay. Thank you. I mean, do. You, uh, oh, that's fine. It's perfect. Um, okay. Uh, on your tablets, um, and we ordinarily don't do this, but um, we're going to just quickly review this today and then we'll vote on it in two weeks or two weeks after that if we need to. Um, we put it out for comment to the audit committee. Um, the year before last, the audit committee raised some comments about uh, us having a more formal purchasing policy. Historically, we've had guidelines in finance, which quite honestly, I, the first year I was here, I didn't know there were guidelines in finance. So um, most other towns have either ordinances or, or selectman policies. So what Lunda has done here over the past several months is combined his his uh, finance department guidelines with other procedural aspects of our purchasing and procurement policies um, to put it into one document. This was reviewed by the advisory committee on buildings and infrastructure at their meeting two weeks ago, and got we got comments from various members there. Um, so. Um, if you want to talk about it now, given the length of our agenda today, we could defer and just discuss it in two weeks. It's not urgent that we approve it in two weeks, but however much time you want to have to discuss it. Um, I, I know I'll, I'll be interested in how does this differ from what we're doing now? I can uh, wait. Yeah, why don't, why, don't we, why don't we defer to discussion of the, just because of where we are with this agenda today. Why don't we defer the discussion on this for two weeks? But you have you have it in your hands now to, to uh, carefully review it for two weeks. Um, it has gone through comments and. Uh, uh, are, are you expecting to get audit committee comments within the next two weeks? Well, yeah, because we. Uh, we yes. <laughs> so why don't we? Why don't we? I think we should defer until. We should be the last stop for approving this. Yeah, but if you have any, for that matter, why don't you review it and then talk to Tiger and Lunda, who, who have been the primary architects of this. Um, it's a moving, yep. it's been a moving document, and um, uh, why don't you talk to them directly about any questions you have? So then we can do a further discussion in public uh, in two weeks or two weeks after that, whenever however long it takes to to get through this, but. It's a, a. It's really a formalization of a of a pro policy. It was uh, kind of not very explicit, and people regarded it as guidelines, and therefore not as rigorous as a, as a what is like a policy. No, I. To be clear, I think this is long overdue, and I will take the opportunity to to read it carefully and provide comments to Tiger and Lunda. Excellent. 
Um, okay, so with that, I'll we'll defer on further action on that for two weeks. Um, and then financial update, Linda. Sure. So you have um, you have on your tablets the uh, financial update. Uh, this is similar to what I presented to you two weeks ago. Um, I shared this uh, with the Board of Finance. Uh, what I've done is I've updated uh, year to date expenditures as of yesterday, um, and I did uh, continue to do a preliminary update of, of year end forecasting. Um, at this point, um, as I shared last week, um, our series of revenues are trending well. Uh, we have our tax collections continue to be um, above, above budget, both current year and prior year. Um, our investment income is performing well. However, we do have a series of other line items, and this is on page two of the document, where some of the other revenues are not um, trending as well, largely the result of the um, of, of COVID. So our parking, our parking revenues, typically we send out those parking permits in May, and that is a cyclical revenue item. We typically get revenues in May, June, and July. That's about a $650,000 item. Um, because there aren't uh, people commuting and therefore those May statements are not gonna go out. So we are foregoing that May and June revenue that typically closes out the year. So that's almost about a 450 or so thousand dollar revenue um, loss um, as a result of not sending those, those payments out. Um, earlier we've, we had discussions about building permits have, have been trending down from the beginning of the year um, and those are also not going to meet our, our budgeted numbers. And therefore, our overall collections is still going to exceed our budget. Um, but in, historically, in addition to our tax revenues collections being at 99, in excess of 99% when we budget 98 and a half, we also had, we also hit the mark on these other revenues. So this year, because those other revenues are not hitting the target, the excess collections in taxes is making up for the under collections in revenue. Uh, the total impact is still an over collection, but not to the extent that we've seen in prior years. Uh, likewise, on the, on the expense side, uh, we are still going to spend less than what we had budgeted to spend, uh, primarily the result of just uh, on personnel expenses, uh, result of turnover, um, and so forth. But then we also have added expenses that we began to include uh, related to COVID. Um, the item that you just approved for Tiger and the barricades, that's an example of those expenses uh, that are coming up. Um, some of these are known, some of these are unknown. Um, and so therefore we're projecting by year end, we'll have about 220, $230,000 or so of COVID related expenses. Uh, but all in all, our total revenues are going to exceed our budgeted revenues. Uh, total expenditures is going to come slightly below total expenditures. However, that gap difference is not going to be the same as in prior years. When we approve this budget, we approved a budget drawing down $3 million from the fund balance, as we do in every year. In prior years, because of the overcollection and the underspend, we make up for that $3 million. This year, although we're over collecting and underspending, but we're not doing so to the extent to make up a $3 million swing. And therefore we anticipate drawing down the fund balance by about a million and a half uh, by the end of the year, which still puts us well within the projections that I shared with you before and we've shared with the Board of Finance. Uh, we have a healthy fund balance. Um, and as you recall, last week when the Board of Finance approved the fund balance allocation for the next fiscal year, they took that into account and lowered their fund balance use from the initial five million to four and a half million. But that is to provide us some cushion for the year that follows. Um, but from a financial perspective, uh, we have sufficient funds um, in the account um, to meet all of these ongoing expenses. Uh, but that's just a, a, a way of um, giving you some estimates for the end of the year. Um, and I'll come back to you again next month as we get closer to the year, the projections, we keep refining them and we'll have a more um, accurate number. But right now that's, um, that's where we're, we're looking at. This also takes into account, um, even the underspend 
still takes into account an additional million dollar transfer into our internal service fund. As I've shared with you before, we had for two successive years, hadn't transferred the internal service um, fund for bringing on the library. And therefore this fiscal year, we're making up, we're making that correction by including that transfer. We're projecting that to do that in the year end. But even with that, uh, we're still looking at coming in slightly under our approved budget uh, for the year. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions on this, and then there's another item uh, just to add related to the to the mill rate uh, that also requires um, your signature, and I'll share that with you. So, Lona, the uh, the COVID expenses; it, it, these numbers don't reflect any uh, reimbursement from the federal government, right? No, they don't. Um, right now, we're right now we're at 75 percent reimbursement. Um, I think the governor's still working on hopefully getting us to 100%. Uh, we will start submitting those items for reimbursement. We'll see those credits in the next fiscal year. We won't see them this fiscal year, but you're right. Also, also, the, also, you just mentioned the town's COVID expenses. The Board of Ed has separate COVID expenses that we, we haven't built into the summary. So they're, and, provi they're providing. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna assume that um, the, the, the fact that building permit fees, conveyance fees are, are, are way down. Um, I mean, as a lawyer, I can make an argument that that is COVID related, but I'm, I'm assuming that uh, they, those are probably not reimbursable. Correct. Uh, foregone, I don't believe foregone revenues are, and, and Tiger, you can correct me on this because um, you've been through this before. They reimburse actual expenses. Right. I, I, we wouldn't be able to say, well, we, we were supposed to get this amount. That, that, right. That's because actually, those are much more if you look at the numbers on the downturn on the, the permits, those numbers are much higher than the uh, the actual expenses, the COVID direct expenses. Uh, Linda, on, on the commuter parking, right? Um, can, can just walk me through, so people re-up, I think in June um, for a year. Um, explain to me what's gonna happen now uh, because the, the, nobody's commuting. Right, and, and, and Kevin may speak, more, may speak better to this, but typically the, we send out the, um, the statements in May. Right. Um, and the, the period is July 1, I believe, is when, is when the period begins. But typically right. when people get those May statements, they don't wait until July to pay. They start paying them in May and June. And so we get a bulk of that revenue May and June. We get about 70% of that in May and June, and 30% of it trickles in, in July. And what therefore, percent, since what, we're I'm not, sorry, what, what percentage? Right. I'm, I'm just talking about the commuter. I'm looking at the all-in number for parking permits, but that includes fees and tickets. What right. percentage <laughs> is, is commuter? Um, sure. Here, let me go at my detail list here. So, of that, of that revenue amount, commuter parking is six hundred and forty thousand of that. So. Six. Yes, of that, of that 1.3 million that's budgeted for parking permits and fees, 640 of that is permits. And, we and would then expect the rest to get, are... Yeah. We, would expect sorry, to get, we would expect to get the 640 in May or June, right? Yes, we get the 640 in July, May, and June. Of that 640 that we budgeted, we got about 163,000 in July, just from the prior year. And then for this year, we would get the bulk of that in May, June, and then the balance of that will roll into the next fiscal year. So for this year, we collected the portion that was from the prior year in July, but the May billings where we would collect May, June, and July, uh, we don't anticipate collecting for May and June or Plus, receiving any revenue for May and June. Nick, we plan to delay the renewal into into. Uh, August or September, and we'll give people credit for March, April, May, and June. So essentially, when they do their renewal, they'll only pay for eight months for next year, but we really haven't determined yet what, what, what the proper date is to go out with the renewal. So the, the current permits will continue beyond July 1st until we send out the renewal. I think that's great. That's a big hit. It is. 
Um, actually, there's another program, uh, Linda, keep in mind that it's not, FEMA has a 25% uh, deductible, but there's another federally funded program called the COVID Relief Fund or something that there's, the state has, and, and we can apply for reimbursement of COVID-related expenses. And most towns are planning to do that with that fund rather than the FEMA program. So at least the West Cog towns we talked to, so. Any further questions um, about financial yes. update? And then the last item by way of financial update, um, as you know, the uh, Board of Finance approved the, um, set the fund balance um, and, uh, and the proposed mill rate. Um, that does come to you for the Board of Selectmen signature, basically the, the, the tax, uh, the bill rate uh, that requires your signature. So we'll be sending that to you electronically. Uh, but basically, um, it will be certifying that the mill rate for next year will be 18.164, down from the current 18.240. So, so the mill rate is going down, um, and that will come to you for uh, for your signature. When's the last time the mill rate went down? Probably. With um, I'll, I'll have to. I'll have to, Tom. Probably with the reval when the reval went up, yeah. so it's a. It's I assume a, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I forgot to mention something, and perhaps I we should we should have amended the agenda, but you recall we were going to implement a fee increase or change for the trans uh, transfer station. As it's turned out, because of COVID, now the transfer station historically we have people go up to the window at the transfer station to buy, to buy their renewal permit. We, we don't want people to be going up to the window and we've been working on a process um, to do this electronically. But we've discovered that the complexity of what we're dealing with and given the time frame, uh, I'd like to propose that we can the, the idea of uh, having the increase go to $75 for those who don't have a hauling contract. The biggest problem here is validating hauling contracts and how we do that electronically um, and instead um, either keep the $45 fee or increase the $45 fee for everyone um, to say $50 or $55 which is still a bargain compared to Darien which is 100 and what is the tag 100 and 100 what? 125. 125 on the theory that um, uh, it's still a bargain, and uh, some seniors, in response to the proposed 75, asked if we could have a senior rate at $60. So um, I'm not sure we can do that today, or whether we should plan on voting on that in two weeks. In any event, we're not. We we want to make the process electronic, where we will email people and say the fee is X dollars this year. Click here and pay by card, or send us a check. Um, uh, the current Permits can stay in effect beyond July 1 for a month if we adopt this process uh, uh, in two weeks. But again, it's, it's given we don't want people, and actually there's one other aspect of this that Tiger suggested with the uh, change in having the first 300 pounds free, um, that if we implemented that, we would uh, require people to come to the window and pay. Tiger's been looking into installing a uh, card reader at the, at the scales, so people don't have to come to the window, um, but that's not happened yet. So you do it at your car wash now, you s simply swipe your card rather than dealing with a person giving that, your card to them. So in the midst of COVID, it's just really almost impossible, it, it, it's very difficult, if not impossible for us to implement these changes. Um, and therefore, I would propose we vote on it again in two weeks with a different fee structure that we can implement in June and July. I'm okay with that. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Hey, Tiger, um, have we seen a, a marked uptick in, in um, you know, drop off of waste at the, at the transfer station? Because, you know, everybody's home and yeah, we're working from home, but you also, because you're in New Canaan, you know, you say, hey, I'm going to clean out my garage. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I get we're free time. Volumes, volumes and usage of the of the transfer station have definitely increased over the past two months. Right. Absolutely. What's next? 
Okay. Uh, anything further on the financial update? Any questions for Linda? Not here. No? Okay. We'll move to the next item on the agenda is 14, appointment of a replacement on the TDAC committee with Susan Schweitzer, who currently serves on the Conservation Commission. Um, we know Susan, and um, I think is Tucker still on? Tucker, do you want to, our TDAC chairman? Yes. Um, many of you may know Sue Schweitzer. She, um, I had her agenda here. I had her agenda, uh, her resume sitting here for a long, long time, but she served for many, many years um, with the Norwalk Tourism Board and the Redevelopment Board over there, I think for 17 years, but has lived in New Canaan, as Kevin mentioned, serves on the Conservation Commission. Uh, Randy Dahlia, who's been a member of our TDAC committee since we started, has had to step down. He and his wife are um, temporarily heading over to uh, out to I think it's Denver to take care of some uh, aging parents uh, so he had to step down so we had an opening and Sue has expressed interest and I've worked alongside of her um, at uh, region regional level as well as locally so she would like to join and we would like to have her she's, she's got a great resume she does and she's a great person and she is. <laughs> I agree on both. Okay, I move that we appoint Susan Schweitzer to the Tourism and Economic Development Advisory Committee. Um, the, this committee doesn't have terms, um, but, uh, but she, she is replacing someone who resigned. Um, yeah, so Randy Dahlia stepped down. So that's Randy, Randy, Randy uh, is gonna be moving. And, uh, right. So uh, I, I make that motion to make that appointment. Second? Second. Discussion? Right here. Okay, thank, thank you, Susan, for serving and um, moving on to legal fees. Any, thank you, Tucker. <laughs> Tucker's a full-time part of the town of New Canaan now. <laughs> we get a lot really of mileage. Funny. We, just, really funny. We, get lot, <laughs> we get a lot of mileage out of Tucker. <laughs> oh, I, that's, this is being recorded, right? So I can use this when I'm <laughs> Uh, legal fees. Any questions about legal fees on our tablets? Do we move to approve this? Yeah. I just I, I move to approve, but I just had one question, just out of curiosity. What kind of COVID legal expenses do we have? Well, they've been advising on a lot of these governor's orders and stuff. You know, a number of them have, and what they, what they I think they sometimes do is they've been giving us memos, for, such as we got a memo on the dining on the. Uh, so so you know someone has to keep track of these, and there's been now. I forget how many governor's orders and they impact various parts of our town government. So they, uh, they give us advice and they ex expect to be paid. I would note that our legal fees are considerably down under budget. Uh, we brought the budget down last year by 10% from 350 to what, 330. We're bringing it down again for next year's budget to 300. So we're on a, we're on a uh, compared to the rest of the budget. <laughs> we're, we're on a good trend here with legal fees. Yeah, on the XOs, I mean, I think there's been 35 or 40. I mean, it's. I think there's. I think there may be 60. 60. I mean, they. Well, they've gone, they've gone through the alphabet. And now they're up to JJ or LL. Yeah, or... that's yeah, that's it. That's my point. <laughs> it's just crazy, crazy. Uh, any further questions? I'll. I make a motion that we approve the legal fees on the tablets. Second here. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. That's unanimous, Tom. General matters. Um, oh, I'm sorry, number 17 we added to the agenda. What is that item? Backstop work at the Mead Park, large Mead Park field. John, oh, yeah. Go ahead, John. John. I'm sorry. Who Who's talking? Sorry. We're not hearing John. I just got. Uh, we have technical difficulty with somebody's mic. Iger, can you do it? Hear me? Yeah, I can do it. John's breaking up. Um, oh, we have we have an item 18 as well as item 17. No, we did 18. No, already. we did, we did 18. 18. You moved 18 in. Oh. This is basically uh, 
we're looking at uh, we're looking at some work at a large baseball field at Mead um, to need to redo the backstop and uh, some of the fencing in that area. We're uh, so we're asking we reached out to Richter and Segan, asked them to uh, give us a design to help us with layout of that area, um, layout of the uh, of the the backstop itself and the fencing to try to protect and prevent balls from leaving the playing field surface or the playing field. Uh, they came back with a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a proposal for, for uh, $5,855. We added a small contingency uh, to it for a total project of $6,735. The money is available inside that, that budget line item for the, the fencing replacement um, in and around this large baseball field. It's been a problem for a very long time with the, uh, with the layout of this backstop. Um, and going forward, we'd like to some help in getting the design correct and, uh, and, and approved. Did we discuss this in the budget? Dis yes, we did. Oh. Yeah, well, uh, yes, not in, in not in this year's budget and in previous year's budget, but we did. This is this is in monies that's currently around. It's not monies that we're getting. Right. And what do we what do we think the spend is going to be to actually implement the design? I think it was eighty thousand dollars off the top of my head. Sorry. I think that's right. Eighty. It's it's in the in the um, memo. In the memo, I just can't. I can't. I can't. Tom. Tom took over my screen. I can't get the memo back up again. Yeah. So I apologize. Okay. That's okay. It's eight. It's eighty. Um, Tiger. Which direction are the balls going? That the backstop isn't helping. The, the parking lot to the side. It's all Got it. Okay, so cars. We're worried about the cars. Yeah, we're not worried about losing them into the water, you know, or uh, a long shot into a, into the farther parking lot. If somebody hits one of those, they got to be happy. It's just the parking lot and uh, safety for walkers and people, you know, people watching the game or their cars and, and you know, or just a spectator or somebody's fishing, right? Walking to somebody who's fishing. How many cars slash people slash fishermen have been hit on a, on a given in a given year? I don't know how many we have off the top of my head, but over time it's been quite a few. Right. And if you look at the, the design of it, you know the, the not a great design. The the existing design that we have is not is is uh, not adequate. Yeah, yeah, we have to get that fixed. Further questions? I move or approve a request from Parks Department to enter into a contract with Richard, Richard and Segan for a total of 6735 which includes an agency for design services for the fence and backstop replacement at Mead Park Baseball. What, what, what is the expected cost of this pro project to be? Uh, we have $80,000 in the budget for all, all the work. Oh, okay. Second? Second here. Discussion? That's unanimous, Tom. That moves us to our General matters, update and discussion of various town matters. Any, anything we want to discuss? Not here. I would, I would uh, actually just like to say how proud I am of the whole town and its response to COVID. And for the work you're doing, Kevin. Thank you, Kit. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's been a, it, it's, it's, it's really been delightful to see the the way the towns come together. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's it's just um, our citizens, our officials in town, um, health department, fire, PD. I mean, it's it's just been all around uh, a horrible experience, but made so much better by the hard work, dedication, and, and, and courage of uh, our citizens. And the humanity. Right. So, Kev, I assume this is our last Zoom call for a while, <laughs> hopefully. What do you mean? <laughs> Isn't... Uh, I've got six more Zoom calls today. <laughs> no, I meant for, for Board of Selectmen. Well, we... Isn't we, Engel having a town council meetings now in, in person? I thought. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Um, no, somebody that's misinformation. I had somebody told me that. No, actually, you're, you're right, though, in terms of the governor's order. I mean, technically, we could have um, groups of less than five meet in town hall, but we're not going to, uh, I mean, so technically, we could sit in a room 
separated, but I, I didn't think, for, first of all, as, as we've noted, we're not going to reopen town hall until sometime in the middle of June. Right. And we haven't worked out the, the return to work policy. We are having a number of employees return to uh, the office that so we have coverage. Um, and we will gradually work into reopening and allowing visitors and residents to come into town hall. But we discovered virtually everything you need to do can be done by phone and email and online. And um, now that we, when we get the test results back, we'll, I think we'll give people the confidence that there's, there's um, no real uh, concern about the environment here. Um, uh, but we will, uh, we'll get a plan in place and we'll execute on it. But I, we, I didn't contemplate we would uh, plan in-person meetings and the town council as a, as a body of 12, be kind of hard to, for, for them to spread out in the, in the meeting room. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised when I heard that from someone who obviously misinformation, but it's, it would be easier for us if we wanted to, but I, I don't care one way or the other. I, I hadn't thought about it and I'd be happy to talk about it for the next, next meeting if that's what people are inclined to do. Our original plan had it where the meeting rooms were closed for a little while due to the fact that we couldn't, one, you can't have a large space and then two, it's difficult to clean. We'd have to remove chairs, do a whole bunch of reconfiguring um, for both the boardroom and the, the large meeting room. So at present, it, we just felt it would be easier to keep them closed. Yeah, I mean, it's probably more of a messaging issue than anything else. So it's something we might want to discuss. Um, fair point. Anything else? Um, I just want to say that actually, I think the Zoom meetings are working and um, caution is the better part of valor, as they say. <laughs> no, I, I think they do too. I mean, you know, it's, I, I think we're going forward. We're going to find that uh, um, people may, especially the staff, rather than having staff come in for an eight o'clock, seven o'clock meeting at night, they can be on by electronically. Um, so I think we'll figure that out to make it easier for people to attend remotely. Maybe we have to amend our rules, Tom, going forward for, um, right now we're operating under governor's orders. It suspends a lot of local rules and FOIA requirements as far as public access, but it's been working rather well. And I do notice Tiger is smiling, so that, that means something. I have a very short commute, Tom. It's <laughs> actually quite nice. <laughs> anyway, with that, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn and wish you all a happy Memorial Day weekend. We're going to have a, uh, we, we taped our memorial ceremony last Saturday. We'll broadcast it next Monday morning. And um, unfortunately, we won't have our traditional Memorial Day parade this weekend, which would have, would have been uh, hard to believe we're going to break that tradition. Uh, but anyway, um, stay safe. And we'll see you on Zoom soon. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.